Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm the Mellow Mama and today I'll be talking all about sleep for babies and toddlers. And yes, I realize, wow, my voice is like really <clears throat> scratchy right there. Hello, hello, testing one. I realize that that's a very broad spectrum. I'm so sorry that my voice is like this, but I don't have time to like let it get. La 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 la. No, it's still, still. I realize that's a really broad spectrum. From infancy to toddlerhood, which Donovan is now 19 months old. If you're unfamiliar with me and my channel, what's up? I'm Kate. I talk all about conscious living and conscious, respectful parenting with the help of lots of great books, um, articles, blogs, websites, and of course my own personal experience that I'll be referencing today, which in my opinion is the most powerful resource. And yes, I realize sleep changes. There's lots of different transitions between the time of infancy to 19 months old, like my son. However, I've found that applying the general advice that I'm going to give today has been extremely impactful and we've been very fortunate to have a lot of sleep in our household from the time that Donovan was a tiny baby. Yes, I was a nursing mom until about 10 and a half months, almost 11 months, like I almost made it. However, um, that, that didn't affect the fact that Donovan was sleeping through the night at a very early age. And I understand that that's not going to be the experience that every person has. Every baby is different. Every child is different. I don't want you to blame yourself or me or your baby or anybody. Sleep is a learned skill. It's a, it's a difficult thing for pretty much anybody to tackle, but especially this rapidly developing new little person that is your baby. So let's start with that right there. The fact that sleep is a learned skill. I'm sure there are nights that you as an adult person have been feeling a little bit scattered, maybe you've been scrolling on your phone on whatever app you like to scroll on, watching Marvelous Miss Maisel and then you've got something else going on, you're making a snack and then you try to just like go to sleep because you're like, oh shoot, it's whatever time is too late for you. And it's hard. Your brain is trying to process so much stuff that you just fed it. So whether it's the social media you were looking at or the TV show or the book you might have been reading or the conversation you had uh, with your partner or a friend or whoever. And then on top of that, all the tasks that you did that day, the things that you have to do tomorrow, you know, the list goes on and on. Obviously, sometimes it's hard for people to sleep, not to mention the physical aspect of this, which is like, you know, involving your gut health that leads to your mental health, and that's a whole nother conversation. Sleep is hard. That's my point. Sleep is hard for anybody. And Lisa Sunbury Gerber, if you're not familiar with her, she's wonderful. She's one of these great leaders of the RIE movement, which is resources for infant educators. She's specifically great at advising people with sleep for their children. And she says, you can lead a baby to bed but you can't make them sleep. It's kind of like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Sleep, like many other behaviors, is cultivated. It's habitual. So what I'm gonna talk about today is how we made sleep a great habit, something that we look forward to, something that we celebrate. I always put Donovan down before he was asleep. And it's, I know it's a little bit tricky, especially if you're nursing. Baby often falls asleep on the breast, but what I would do, even if he was um, falling asleep on the breast, I would take him off just before he was really, really sacked out and lie him down wherever it was that he was going to sleep, whether it was on his floor mattress or on a docketot or in like the bassinet next to our bed. Typically, it was on his floor mattress in his bedroom um, right away. He was sleeping there in that environment from the moment we got home. I mean, yeah, I just wanted that to be very, very consistent. And that's a typical key that I think you'll hear from a lot of sleep experts, just make the environment consistent. Your baby being awake when you put them down for rest not only allows them to familiarize themselves with that consistent environment, but also lets them feel a little less disoriented by the fact that they are going to be asleep in one place and wake up in the same place and in the same position. As opposed to being upright on you or obviously in the position of nursing and then flat on their back, when they wake up, I was still holding my boob for a second there. Then the obvious one that could be very startling to really anybody is falling asleep somewhere, like on your mom's chest, and then waking up in a different room completely alone. The last thing that we want to do from the very start is make sleep associated with something physically startling. I mean, that's just a great way to sabotage it from the beginning. Observe your baby. Observe your child, your toddler, whoever it is. Observe yourself in the case that you're watching this and you're not somebody that has children. Look for the first signs of tiredness. That is the moment that your child or you are ready for sleep. And when I say they're ready for sleep, I mean it's time to put them down. Even if you're like, well, it's not 
10.30 yet. I know a lot of people like to go off of timers. There are so many resources out there, like mainstream parenting books that instruct you to have a very strict, rigid schedule and timeline, which I'm not opposed to routine. In fact, that's something that I'm going to talk about and really emphasize today. But when you refer to a clock or a timer to understand your child's sleep needs as opposed to their blatant instinctual cues and communication that they're sleepy, you're stifling your motherly instincts and intuition along with their natural sleep ability and patterns. I'll never forget that when I was in the hospital, my nurse was extremely upset with me and she made it very clear that she didn't like the fact that I wouldn't wake up my son to feed him. I would only feed him when he would tell me that he was hungry. So, and obviously Donovan has grown into a, a very beautiful, healthy little boy. I, thank God. But my point here is that they were so adamant about the time, the schedule, every, I think it was two hours. And she was so upset that I wasn't following the schedule and, and I rather followed my son's schedule. I just let him communicate with me. And I, I loved the feeling that we were fostering this beautiful connection and communication from the very moment that he was born. I'm not an expert, I have to clarify, but I really truly believe that that had a big impact on my son's ability to understand his own body, his needs, and to communicate them with me from the very beginning. So following those initial cues, if your baby seems sleepy, it's time to put them down. The longer you wait, the more resistance builds toward the sleep and the harder it's going to get for them to actually go down to rest and sort of wind down and ease into rest. In the case of me and my son Donovan, by the time he gets the second wind, it is extremely difficult for him to go down for a nap or for bedtime and his entire routine gets very thrown off. It's not that we don't have a structured day and he doesn't have a structured time that he goes to sleep every day, but sometimes if I miss that very small window of opportunity where he is tired because I'm like, well, usually he goes down at seven or usually he's napping at 10.30, I, I create a big problem for me and for Donovan and his rest gets pretty badly interrupted those days. Honestly, highly, highly, highly recommend this tip. Notice that your baby's getting sleepy. Immediately, start winding them down. When Donovan goes to sleep overtired, I notice a significant difference in the rest that he actually experiences. So it's not like, okay, well, at least once he's down, he still sleeps perfectly fine. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I miss that window. Donovan's sleep is extremely restless. I notice he moves around a lot more if we're in the same bed or if I kind of peek in on him in the night. And now that he's older and bigger, those are the nights where he definitely comes into my room and he's like, mama, mama, and he wants to sleep in my bed, which is fine, I'm not opposed to that, but my point is that his sleep is completely interrupted and when he wakes up from a nap like that, or a night's rest, or lack thereof like that, he wakes up definitely in kind of a, I hate the word grouchy, but he's definitely not in like the best, most cheerful mood, <laughs> to say the least. Now there are of course days where you're not like in the regular rhythm that you've probably established and there are external factors that affect sleep for all of us. This information honestly I think is relevant for adults and children and babies, whoever needs to hear it. Overstimulation, stress, general tension, a change of environment, we've had kind of a lot of those obviously personally. So the reason I bring those up is because I want everybody to be mindful of all of the things that might be affecting your child's sleep. That way you don't fall into the category of somebody that's blaming their child or blaming themselves or getting extremely frustrated and confused. Like, I'm doing all the things that you said, Kate. I'm noticing when he's tired, I'm putting him down, we're winding down, we have a routine, and it's still not. Don't, don't stress out. There are so many factors that go into sleep and you need to be aware of them. Honestly, I think when we bring more mindfulness to this, just like anything else, it breeds a sense of like calm. It's hard to get stressed out when you truly understand and empathize with your child and, and think, well, there has been a lot of tension. I bet that's a lot to process, especially because you're so new. I mean, Donovan's not even two years old. I often say that to myself, oh my gosh, you're so new, Donovan. I can't, I, you know, in my head, like you're doing such a beautiful job processing all of this because he really is so resilient and he does process things so beautifully and sort of effortlessly. I wish that I were the same. That being said, there are days where for some reason, 
and it might be any of the ones that I listed. His sleep isn't the best and, and getting him to go down and wind down isn't an easy task. It's something that might make me feel a little bit anxious or stressed or frustrated. Take that mindfulness a step further by eliminating those things when you can. Really try to respect your child's needs and your own needs if you're somebody, once again, that's trying to sleep better. Eliminate anything that's bringing tension into your household or bringing in energy that's making you feel a little bit um, restless that would naturally make anybody resist sleep. We haven't always been consistent with this, especially when we lived in Los Angeles and I was like a little bit more flexible, I guess. But over time, I really learned the value of having an extremely early bedtime, 6.30 or 7 o'clock. I highly recommend keeping it in that window. At the latest, 7.30, but the 6.30 to 7.30 window is golden for me. And there are a few moms that I've talked to about sleep and I've told them, hey, the earlier the better. This is advice that I took directly from Magda Gerber's book, Dear Parent Caring for Infants with Respect, and I highly regret the fact that I didn't do it sooner. I truly wish that I would have really taken this seriously and been like, no, you know, 6.30 to 7.30 is the perfect window because I saw a significant increase in Donovan's sleep and a more richer, fuller development of his sleep. Many people, including myself a year ago, assume that putting your baby down earlier means that they're going to wake up earlier. And I, in fact, saw the complete opposite. Donovan slept about an hour and a half to two hours longer than if he went down at, let's say, 8.30 or 8 o'clock than he did when he went to bed at 6.30 or 7. So he'll sleep from 6.30 or 7 o'clock until 7.30, 8 the next day. And I know that sounds like crazy to some people. They're like, what? What do you mean your baby's sleeping over 12 hours in the night? And sometimes he really does. I'm scouts on her. And not that it matters that much because we're really just trying to focus on healthy sleep for you and your child, but your child going to bed at 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night leaves you a much larger window for whatever work that you need to accomplish once they're down for bed. And that leads to you having an earlier bedtime and being able to wake up before them and prepare things and feel taking care of yourself. Now let's cover routine. Routine is everything and there's a reason that everybody says that, you know, a baby thrives on a predictable schedule because they really do. Not only has it had a wonderful impact on Donovan's sleep to be on a predictable schedule, but it's also been incredible for our ability to actually just communicate in general. When Donovan can understand and predict what is coming next in his day, we have such an easier time together. Our relationship becomes more like PB and J instead of whatever foods that don't go, don't go well. The reason for that is I can easily know, okay, Donovan really wants to eat now. He's getting hungry. He knows that food is coming and that's what's bothering him. Let's say if he's, when he was little, uh, like a baby baby, if he started maybe getting fussy or expressing something to me that he was uncomfortable or unhappy, I could usually understand like, oh, well, yeah, it is that time. It's that time that we go um, outside or it's that time that he goes uh, down for a nap. So having a predictable routine that your baby can understand and start to expect is incredibly beneficial for a lot of a lot of what is important in these early years, but especially rest. The time frame in which we eat, play outdoors, rest, maybe go somewhere or play outside again or play inside bathe, all stay the same. We always have the same general structure to our day, whether it's um, at a museum one day or at the library, it's still that same frame. He understands, okay, we're going somewhere at this time after my afternoon nap, for example. He can anticipate the fact that once we're home, we'll be having dinner. Most of the time we go for a small walk, even if it's just 10 minutes, and we bathe and do our nighttime bedtime routine where I allow him to wind down but the point is that he anticipates all of that he sees it all coming and he gets used to that daily routine I mentioned in the beginning of this video that I think this advice is relevant for really any age but please do once again bring awareness to the fact that there are going to be a lot of big sleep changes for your baby especially during periods of teething separation anxiety maybe sickness and in those times where you really are just doing your best, you're implementing the things that I talk about today or whatever advice that you think is really helpful and it's just not, you're still not getting any rest, your baby isn't getting a healthy amount of rest, ask for help from your partner or from somebody that you trust to at least have 15 to 30 minutes of alone time 
if that's an option for you and and go to a place that makes you feel peaceful, whether it's internally or externally. Find that happy place. I know it sounds corny. Sometimes I have a tendency to like say cheesy things, but find that happy place. Figure out what it is or where it is that makes you think, wow, you know what? This is a phase. I'm doing a great job because you are doing a great job. And, and understand that it's all good. It's okay. Baby is growing up you know, faster than the speed of light and, and they are going to be fine. Everything is going to be okay. You are going to rest again one day. For me personally, this ties into my next important piece of advice that I know a lot of people can't take and I, I want you to be like, I, I understand that this is still really good advice to give, so go ahead and give it, Kate, even though I live in the Arctic tundra where we live. Get outside as much as you possibly can. That not only was my happy place to go to our local park that I was just in love with, but also just walking outside in the apartment complex that we lived. It had this big, beautiful hill and downhill, and we would just do loops there and walk in the courtyard. And it brought me so much peace to just take in the fresh air, look around, and count my blessings. Once again, cheesiest thing to say, but I truly mean it. I would say all the things that are going well in my life, and 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 going well as far as how I was raising my son in such a beautiful way and how our relationship was just developing so wonderfully and all of the things that made me feel good I would remind myself of those and I would I would focus so heavily on what was going well and the fact that my son was healthy and that he was so precious to me and beautiful and that we had everything that we needed and just taking even five minutes to do that makes a huge, huge shift personally for me in my day, but for really anybody's day in my opinion. So that was what I loved doing. I loved going outside and just being like, okay, bud, we're going together because I didn't have help at the time and I didn't have somebody, you know, Ben worked an awful lot and when he was home, I didn't really like to give him any, I didn't want to bother him. I know it sounds horrible, but I, I didn't want to like bother him with asking for help. I really didn't. I wanted to be this like super woman, super mom person that did it all. And and wow, like you know, looking back, I really truly wish that I would have been like, hey, you know, I need some alone time or I want some time for me. Uh, but I rarely, rarely did that. And the way that I still survived and didn't feel like I was getting a twitchy eye or feeling crazy or unstable was the fact that even if I didn't have somebody doing it for me, I made intentional time for me, my mental health, and my well-being by discovering the fact that I just loved being outside with Donovan. I would take him with me, we'd go on lots and lots of strolls and spend lots of time on, you know, a big quilt just in the grass and once again, huge advantage to living in a beautiful climate and state like California's but I think in general if you're a place that has seasons and it, and really even if you're in a place that's cold a lot of the time there are still so many benefits to getting outside. I personally found that it was extremely enjoyable actually to be with my son because we were both at peace. We were both just like yeah it's all good we've got this and being outside not only did that for me, brought that inner peace to me, but I think it brought a sense of stillness and peace to my son. And in my opinion, contributed greatly to his wonderful sleep and his ability to transition well out of those phases where he wasn't sleeping so good. So get outside as much as you can for you and for your baby's sake. If it's a warmer, nicer climate like the one that I was in, take naps outside, relax outside. A good investment would be a playpen if you don't have like an enclosed park or something like that but I truly believe that being out in nature I mean it's proven scientifically I can't just say this is my opinion but being outside is really conducive for good sleep lastly we developed a very specific ritual before nap times and bedtimes it consisted of a lot of narrating what was happening in a way that reminded Donovan that it was time for rest an example of what that looks like for me specifically and for Donovan is the following after breakfast every day once I've cleaned up he usually is doing some independent play after he eaten in his bedroom. We go for a walk. Right now it's winter time. We bundle up, we go outside, and we do a little bit of exploring, just walking all around our neighborhood. A lot of time we'll also head to the park that's about 10 minutes down the road for a solid 45 minutes to an hour. As soon as Donovan is showing a little bit of tiredness, whether it's rubbing his eye, 
yawning. Sometimes he'll just sort of start to seem like he's getting a little bit irritable, like frustrated by certain things that typically don't bother him. Give him the cue that it's time to go home and that we're going to go ahead and start winding down for now. And even before I start to notice signs of tiredness, I remind Donovan periodically during his play, we're going to be going home in about 15 minutes, or we're going to be going home in about 10 minutes and it'll be nap time, we're going to wind down for bed. Once we are home, I'm constantly narrating, I'm going to make sure that you have a clean diaper before you wind down for bed. So I change his diaper if it needs changing and he, some, he sits on the potty because we do elimination communication. A lot of times he'll go to the bathroom before we nap. That's step one. And then it's cleanup time. So we'll clean up whatever toys he was playing with earlier in the day before we left the house. And as we're cleaning up, I'll say things that indicate that we're going to sleep, but he's going to be up and able to play after. Such as, okay, we're putting the blocks in the basket, but they'll be right there for you when you wake up to play again. The drum goes right on top, yep, and it'll be right there when you wake up. Then Donovan selects two or three books. I, I keep it to just three now so that he knows, okay, after the third book we don't keep going. That's when it's time to really relax. He doesn't necessarily have to shut his eyes or something. It's not automatic. You can't make anybody sleep, but he chooses a few books, lays down in his bed. I tell Donovan, okay, I'm going to close the curtains now or the blinds to make it darker in here for your nap. And we actually read a couple of books. Typically we use this little um, nightlight that I have. It's really, really helpful. Oh, I'll grab it right now and show you. There. This one's perfect because it's actually chargeable. It doesn't require batteries. There's a little slot there. I don't know. This is not sponsored at all. I'm just, I love this book light because I love reading before bed. It has a couple of different <sighs> phases. Um, it's called Lumino Light. And I can't see now. Hold on. Here you go. I'm a big fan of this one just because we do like to make it nice and dark in Donovan's room, which is a big part of our routine. But when we go to read the books, I don't like to read all of the books and he's nice and cozy and ready to close his eyes. And then I get up and I turn off the light and it's abrupt. This is so much nicer because I'll read and by the second or if we're feeling Frisky, the third book, his eyes start to get heavy and all I have to do is click off the light and, you know, give him a kiss. A lot of the time then I'll sing a little song to him and he's out. That's our routine every single time Donovan needs to rest. The only thing that's different about that routine at nighttime is the fact that after we go for a walk and we come inside, we take a bath. But what I'm really doing for Donovan is something that I really wish that I did a better job with for myself and that's giving him these unwinding skills. This is a learned behavior. This is a habit that we're developing. Understanding how to unwrap and unravel after a long day. And that's it, you guys. That's all the advice that I have to give you today. Of course, there are some more specific tips and um, how to deal with specific circumstances, but I think this is a good general overview of how to at least get on the path to healthier sleep for you and your children. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you have anything to add, anything that's helped you specifically to sleep better or for your kids to sleep better and more peacefully, please put it in the comments below. As always, I appreciate you guys so much for watching my content. Please, if you enjoyed this, subscribe to my channel and I post every Monday, Thursday and Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Follow me on Instagram at the Mellow Mama if you want to see like a peek into what Donovan and I's daily life looks like. Also get some organic teaching moments regarding respectful parenting that are really just happening right then and there um, as Donovan and I are going about our day. And it's just a great way to connect with me directly. If you have any really specific questions for me or if you'd like to work with me in some way, um, just send me a message there. I really do try my best to personally and thoughtfully respond to every single person that reaches out. So yeah, I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you, and I will see you on the next one.